Funding for the Maddie Report is made possible by grants from the California Emerging Technology Fund, leaders in the quest for digital equity. The James Irvine Foundation, committed to a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. Fresno State Associated Students, Inc. Students serving students. BNSF Railway, moving our economy for 160 years. And the wonderful company. The Maddie Report is also made possible thanks to contributions from Harris Ranch Inn and Restaurant and E&J Gallo Winery. From the Maddie Institute, the Public Policy Institute for the Valley's four public universities, this is the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. The challenges that existed pre-pandemic are sure to be with us post-pandemic, perhaps even made worse by the pandemic. What is the federal government's role in addressing some of these issues? First, we'll hear from a Valley Democratic legislator to get a Democratic perspective on these issues, and he is Congressman Jim Costa, a Democrat from Fresno. Welcome back to the Maddie Report. Well, thank you very much, Mark Kepler. Uh, it's my honor to be on the Maddie Report and being a uh, member of the advisory board. Uh, I'm always excited to be on uh, on the uh, uh, re interview with you, and you do a good job. And thank you for the entire board that really, I think, wholeheartedly supports this effort. Well, thank thank you very much for those very kind words. You, you, you've been with us since the inception of the Maddie Institute, so, so thank you for that. Let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to talk about the issue of, of income inequality first. Uh, big issue. I'm wondering if, if there's going to be a renewed focus on not only helping businesses after you know the pandemic, but making a more inclusive uh, and equitable economy. Other than tax cuts, are there things that the federal government can do to kind of close that income inequality gap? Well, I think that this pandemic uh, has uh, had a profound effect, uh, not only throughout the world, but here in the United States. Uh, I don't think uh, 100, uh, 100 years ago was the last pandemic, uh, uh, the Spanish flu. But of course, this has had a far greater magnitude in terms of every element of American life and society, socially and economically. And while we've had social disparities that have existed uh, you know, for decades, uh, this pandemic has, uh, I think, uncovered in ways that many Americans would not notice uh, to the degree that we do today, the social and economic disparities in healthcare, in education, and in housing have been uh, front and center uh, well, let me, let me around our country. Actually, it's a great segue to, to my next question, frankly, and that is on healthcare. Um, you know, what are we going to see? What's the future of, of Obamacare, the ACA? Are we going to see any changes there? Yes, I think we're going to see an opportunity to make improvements that we should have done over the last uh, 10 years since its inception. Unfortunately, um, most of my Republican colleagues uh, wanted to eliminate it. Uh, I lost track of how many times I voted to oppose uh, repealing the act. Uh, it got over 70 times without putting anything in its place. Uh, it certainly was not perfect. We know that there were many areas where it was deficient. And we've always been prepared to address those deficiencies. However, that has never been the strategy uh, for uh, my Republican colleagues. But I think with a, uh, a Democratic administration, uh, certainly uh, President Biden during the campaign was talked about uh, universal health care. And he said that was not the way he, he, he wanted to go, that uh, he wanted to uh, address the deficiencies in the Affordable Health Care Act. And I think uh, there's always there's already been legislation um, to deal with issues of uh, more efficient and cost effective ways to provide care uh, efforts to have greater access. Let me say, by the way, you know, it's it's popular today when I voted for it in 2010, it was not popular in my district alone. Twenty four percent of my constituency had no health care insurance and 17 percent were underinsured. 11 years later, that number of 24% has dropped to 10% with no insurance. Yeah. And the underinsured has also uh, improved significantly. But there's a lot more that we need to do. Yeah, let me ask you another question. It's kind of related. Um, we've only got a minute left in this segment. I want to ask you about immigration reform. Um, are we going to see anything on immigration reform? Yes. Uh, and we're going to see it in March. We have several efforts that are taking place. There's a comprehensive immigration reform package. 
I supported that when I first came to Congress, when President Bush was in office. As a matter of fact, in 2013, the Republican-controlled Senate passed a bipartisan comprehensive package, 68 to uh, 20, uh, uh, 22, um, excuse me, 32, 68 to 32, overwhelmingly bipartisan. And the votes were there in the House of Speaker Boehner had brought it up. But we're going to see a comprehensive package. We're going to see a uh, relief for dreamers and the Farm Worker Modernization Act. It will all be introduced in the next month. And uh, I think that there's a good chance that those will uh, pass out of the House in April. Okay, I guess we'll see them. Well, up next, we're going to get the Republican response to these issues with Congressman David Valadeo from Hanford. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. And we hope. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. We're talking about how best to address challenges that existed pre-pandemic that will surely be with us in the post-pandemic period. What are the Republicans' ideas to address some of these problems? Our guest is Congressman David Valadeo from Hanford, Republican from Hanford. Welcome back to the Maddie Report. Thanks for having me on, Mark. So um, I was wondering, you know, they say that the, the, the best uh, poverty program is a job. And, you know, companies are going to be dealing with a lot of things post-pandemic uh, coming out of it. Um, there's also the issue of income inequality. I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the ideas other than tax cuts? Are there other ideas that can help kind of close that economic divide and also help businesses at the same time? Now, I was thinking about things like maybe whether it's increasing the minimum wage or dealing with the digital divide or, you know, helping apprenticeship programs. What are your ideas on those, on those I mean, issues? It really is a, a lot of the different ideas. There's no silver bullet for, uh, for any one of these uh, problems. And so, yeah, making sure that uh, we have internet access in our communities. Uh, that helps us attract more business investment, making sure that we uh, have good common sense regulatory reform so that uh, businesses can be successful. Trade policy plays a role in it. Uh, making sure that we have good infrastructure so that uh, if someone wants to, uh, wants to invest here in the Central Valley, they feel like uh, they have an opportunity to move product and the product is able to move on our freeways and highways. And uh, all these things play a role in bringing those investments, creating those jobs here in the Central Valley. And so that's something that I think is important. So any one of those topics, um, there's a lot of different avenues, a lot of different ways that government can be helpful or even government get out of the way. Uh, but all those play a role in making sure that we attract jobs and create uh, an opportunity for employment here in the Central Valley. Yeah, it's a kind of all of the above approach, huh? So let me ask you another quite another big issue, healthcare, um, Obamacare, AC, America, uh, the ACA. Uh, what's the what are the Republicans thinking on that issue these days? Well, obviously, it's not talked about as much, but it is still in place. It is still affecting uh, a lot of our communities. And there are parts of the Affordable Care Act uh, that need to be addre uh, addressed, making sure that uh, that it works for everyone. And uh, and right now, making sure that people have access to care is important. And the thing that we see here with the Affordable Care Act in California specifically, or at least the 21st Congressional District, there really isn't a lot of people who are actually taking part in the Affordable Care Act itself. Uh, they're taking advantage of the situation uh, with uh, Medicaid expansion and Medicaid itself, and the majority of the constituents are, are part of that or private insurance. Uh, but if we want Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare to work, we have to make sure that it, we lower the cost so that people can actually afford it, give them that avenue to be able to get off of Medicaid and onto Obamacare and actually have some sort of insurance that they play a role in so that it uh, obviously plays a role in our communities. Uh, but also reimbursement rates also play a role in making sure we can attract doctors into our area. Right, right. Lists. All those things are important. Yeah, because you have if you have insurance, but you can't find a doctor, it doesn't really solve the problem. And reimbursement rates have been a, been a big issue. Uh, what about immigration reform? Um, where, where are the Republicans on that? I know you're kind of out there leading on immigration reform efforts. Is the rest of the caucus with you? Well, everyone's a little bit different. And even when uh, uh, when President Obama was uh, had when he was president and had the entire uh, both Congress and the Senate, 
uh, he wasn't able to pass immigration reform either. So it is a bipartisan issue. There are Republicans and Democrats who are in favor, and there are some uh, Democrats and Republicans who are in opposition to it. Uh, it's a controversial topic with a lot of different details that need to be addressed. Um, guest worker programs are obviously important here in the Central Valley. DACA, Dreamer uh, legislation is something that has a lot more bipartisan support, but also improving our system as is uh, so that it allows people who want to immigrate to this country to have a, a, a more simpler path or a path that's actually um, that can be achieved is also important. Do you see there might be, you know, the stars might be aligned that maybe we'll get some action on immigration reform? I really hope so. I mean, this president, President Biden, has actually talked about it quite a bit. He's offered some executive order, orders, which I'm not a fan of executive orders, uh, but uh, he needs to start talking to Congress and making sure that we can pass some legislation. He has both houses right now. Obviously, President Biden and Democrats control the House uh, and the Senate and the White House. So they have the opportunity to pass legislation. The Senate still has the threshold. There are 60 votes, so they do need to work with Republicans. Uh, there are a lot of Republicans in the House that are open to this dialogue, but we want to make sure that it is common sense. Let me ask you one last question in this segment. I want to ask you about uh, housing and homelessness uh, issues. Those issues are ongoing. I'm wondering um, what should or is the federal government doing to help address those issues here in the Valley? Well, making sure that we have uh, grants available so that communities can invest in uh, more affordable types of home. And we've got self-help. We've got other types of uh, housing that is available. Uh, but we have to make sure that whatever is available is something that actually works for our communities. Uh, I represent a lot of very small communities, and some of them are making investments in these little, like, tiny house-type developments with uh, 70 to 100 homes. And I've got others who are actually doing things like self-help, where the person actually builds their own home, well, their own sweat equity. And those are the most uh, suitable. Uh, but we also have to address other issues that are driving homelessness, uh, obviously mental care, mental health, and uh, and drug-related issues. And those are all things that I think federal government can play a role in, but isn't going to be a silver bullet in. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, up next, we're going to turn our attention to some longer-term issues. One of those is man-made climate change. What is the Democrats' response on that issue? We're going to talk with Democratic Congressman Jim Costa next. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddy Institute. According to NASA, quote, multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. So while this is an issue that requires national and international uh, response, there are also some significant implications for the Valley. First, let's get the Democratic perspective. About back with us is Democratic Congressman Jim Costa of Fresno. So uh, Congressman Costa, researchers are saying that climate change is going to have some impacts on the agricultural industry. One of the ways it's going to impact ag is uh, the prevalence of pests, that, that they are going to be more prevalent uh, going forward. I'm wondering, when does the federal response uh, to address this issue? Well, climate change is real. It's undeniable. 200 years ago, we had 100 and 200 million people in the planet. And uh, a couple of years ago, we turned 7 billion. And by the middle of the century, it's going to be 9 billion. Um, and it affects our valley. It affects our valley in terms of how we uh, maintain our agriculture economy, in terms of invasive species and how we address those issues. Uh, it affects our economy in terms of uh, water uh, and in terms of the, the air quality. Uh, it's multifaceted. Uh, are rejoining the Paris Climate Accord by this new administration, I think is important. Uh, the president has made it one of his uh, highest priorities. I really believe it's the challenge uh, of the 21st century, not just for our valley, but for the entire planet. Well, you know, another issue that the climate change is gonna affect is water, um, something you're an expert on. Um, so, you know, groundwater pumping is, is you can't really do that anymore. That's really not an ongoing sustainable way to get reliable, yeah. And adequate supplies of water. So what can be done to assure an adequate and reliable supply of water going forward? Well, we have to be smart. And, and uh, climate change means that you have to focus on sustainability. 
and our sustainability of a water supply means you've got to balance your groundwater with our surface water supply. And that becomes more challenging. We have a historical law that was signed uh, in Sacramento three years ago called a Sustainable Integrated Groundwater Management Plan, SIGMA. And what that means is uh, over the course of the next 15 years, we have to bring into balance our groundwater withdrawals from uh, our yearly use. And that's not easy because we're overdrafting. And my parents told me a long time ago, if you have a bank account, you continue to make withdrawals and you don't make deposits, it doesn't last too long. Um, our water measurement with our snowpack is in 10 year averages. Uh, that's how you have to measure water. We have some very good years. We have some very bad years. This year doesn't look too good. And we have average years. Consequently, what we have to do is to figure out a strategy to make our water supply sustainable for agriculture over the long term. And that means that likely our snowpacks are not going to be as heavy as they have been traditionally. Our measurement of that, we're going to have more uh, uh, events of storms that uh, make the snowpack higher in elevation. And that means we're gonna have to operate our reservoirs differently than we have over the past decades. And that requires innovation in terms of our water management use. And that's one of the impacts of climate change. Yeah, and the also issue, as you know, subsidence and it's affecting the, 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 the Frying Kern Canal, you know, repairs have to be done there so the water can move more efficiently, lots of issues. Let me transition to another issue that climate change has an effect on, and that is wildfires. Um, California's had some horrific wildfires over the last few years. Last year saw almost 4 million acres uh, burn across California, which is a record uh, in, in the state, state's history. You know, a lot of people are surprised to learn that the federal government actually owns a majority of the forests in California. 57% of the forests are owned by the federal government. What can or should the federal government do to mitigate this problem? Combination of factors. Number one, we have to do better land management for our forestries. And with the federal government having over 60% of those forests, we've got to do a better job of clearing and thinning. Uh, our, our monies that we've set aside for uh, forest management uh, in recent years because of these horrific fires has been used to put the fires out. Uh, it's estimated that we really need to review our entire western state's uh, forest management plan. So that's number one. Number two, land use uh, management by local government we have hundreds and thousands of people living today uh, in, in forestry areas and, and foothill areas that they didn't live 30, 40 years ago. And that's a problem. And, yeah. and, and finally, uh, we have to take into account that when we better manage our forests, we allow better use of the rainfall and the snow that we do get. It gives us better water management and it will allow us to uh, better combat the uh, fires that will continue to come. And with the climate change, we've got to be smart in how we do that. Okay. Well, I want to thank our conversation with Democratic Congressman Jim Costa of Fresno. We're going to get the Republican response in a moment when David Valdeo tells us how the, Dem the Republicans are going to deal with climate change. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Mad Institute. We're talking about man-made climate change and the implications for life here in the Valley. Uh, we want to get the Republican perspective on this issue. So back with us is Republican Congressman David Valadeo. Um, so Congressman Valadeo, we were talking with your colleague, Democratic Congressman uh, Jim Costa, about uh, the impact of earlier springs and hotter growing seasons and the increased prevalence of destructive insects on Valley agriculture. I'm wondering, does the federal government have a role to play here? I mean, the federal government plays a role in everything, it seems, uh, but especially when it comes into programs like this that affect so many, uh, I, I do believe that especially when it comes to research uh, coordination with uh, different industries, uh, it does play a role for us to allow uh, federal government to play a, a role in it. You know, and another issue that's kind of related to this is um, water, a big issue. I know you and, and Congressman Costa are very focused on, on the water issue. 
Um, given the fact that continuing uh, pumping of groundwater really is not a sustainable option going forward, uh, what can the federal government do to make sure we have an adequate and reliable source of water going forward? Well, surface water is our solution and uh, making sure we have good common sense water policy uh, is the only way we're going to get to that. And Costa and I have worked together on this for a number of years now. Uh, we've passed legislation like the WIN Act became law under President Obama. That was helpful. Uh, President Trump signed the executive order to get that record of decision done in February 2020. And uh, as soon as Governor, uh, Governor Newsom's uh, lawsuit is over with, uh, we can actually see some uh, positive results from that. But surface water is really where, where we have to be if we're going to continue to survive here in the Central Valley. It's not just about agriculture. A lot of our communities survive on on water from outside of the area as well. And so we have to make sure that uh, we have good common sense policy there at the federal level uh, to give us that surface water. You know, part of that, too, is the issue of subsidence, ground sinking and dealing with the canal. So some of the money in that uh, act that you're referring to has will be going to repairing the canal as well. Yes, uh, WIN Act money, uh, especially with extensions now that that I offered a new legislation that I just introduced, uh, will allow for more projects to to be able to uh, be successful because of the resources from the WIN Act. Uh, but yeah, some of it is going to the Frank Kern Canal, some of it's actually going into other parts of the valley, uh, being very helpful. And there's even some changes in contracts with uh, communities that are able to get um, uh, better water supplies now. Yeah, you know, that's, that's actually, I think a lot of people don't realize how important that issue is dealing fixing the canal because it's not as efficient in moving the water because the cracks and and what have you. So repairing that is actually a way to, in a a way to produce more water because it's more efficient with the water you already have. Um, That's a big issue. Um, I want to also ask you about forest fires. Uh, Big issue in California. It seems they're getting worse and worse. Uh, A lot of people don't realize that uh, the federal government actually controls a majority of California forests, about 57% or 19 million acres. Um, So, what can or should the federal government do to address the issue of California wildfires? Well, I mean, obviously, better management of our forests would play a major role in it, but also the tools uh, that we need to make sure we fight those fires before they get out of control. And uh, so I think the federal government could do a better job of managing the resources, uh, allowing uh, things like animals, cows, cattle to go up there and and, uh, graze on the grasses to keep that underbrush down. But uh, when the fire does start, we actually have a business right here in the Central Valley that can do a good job of helping us with uh, the tools to fight those fires and using planes that aren't being used to fight fires, give them uh, the ability to actually help fight fires and and help us put uh, uh, in them quicker. And and I think we've got a lot of resources that we're not using and we need to start using them as quickly as possible. Yeah, we had, we had done actually a report, uh, done a report on the Little Hoover Commission that did a report on wildfires in California. One of the things they found was we've had a fire suppression strategy for 100 years. And instead of letting fires burn and getting rid of the undergrowth, they're controlling those. And it just makes over time makes it worse and worse and worse. And so one of the issues that they were talking about was maybe having more controlled burns. Um, really have to pick your poison, right? Uh you're going to have some pollution, maybe, because you're having the controlled burns, or you don't do anything, and it's going to be much worse later on. Uh, one last issue I want to ask you about in this segment, and that is um, your feeling about uh, high-speed rail, given that you know President Biden has shown some affection for, for rail. His Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, says he, United, he wants the United States to be the leader in, in high-speed rail. Um, what do you think it means for your district? I, I know that it's a contentious issue. Uh, but it does mean billions of dollars uh, for your district. Now, there's a lot of investment here in the Central Valley, and I'm I'm happy to see investment come in, in the job creation. I would prefer those resources be spent on water, uh, but now that the high-speed rail is being built, and the, the uh, even President Trump actually sent some resources very very early on in his uh, administration. He had sent, I think, about 100 to $300 million. Um, so I expect that this administration will do the same. My job is to make sure that they do it well and they do it to the best ability. Obviously, it's had an impact on a lot of our farmers and a lot of our communities, some of it positive, uh, but especially people on the ground. They've not been uh, happy with it. And if you see what's going on uh, with it so far, I mean, they're just not being a very good uh, steward of of taxpayer resources and we need to hold them accountable. Um, Fair enough. Well, I want to thank our guests, uh, Congressman David Valdeo and and Democratic Congressman Jim Costa for joining us. I also appreciate them taking the time to speak with us. This is Mark Kepler for The Matter Report. Thanks for joining us. The views expressed in The Matter Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Maddie Institute. If you'd like to share your thoughts about today's episode of The Matter Report, please visit our website at maddieinstitute.org.